The uh, next section is uh, Sam I Am. We're going to be talking about the Windows SAM file and uh, local passwords. First of all, if we've talked about uh, the Windows SAM file, we're talking about two types of uh, hashes that are generally stored. The first and the simple and the old fashioned ones are the ALA hashes. Thanks, guys, that was great. I'll get the video up uh, sometime next week, most likely. Okay. Assuming my video equipment doesn't crap out on me. Alright, uh, Land Manager, basically, did anybody ever actually use Land Manager back in the day? Sure. See, I never did. Uh, Land Manager was basically uh, the answer to uh, Novell Netware back in the days when it ran on top of DOS. We're talking pre NT. But they implement a lot of the same stuff inside of Windows. Uh, the LM hash, and maybe I'm getting this all wrong, but that, that, the LM hash is how it stored passwords. An LM hash is incredibly weak as far as the hashing algorithm is concerned. It's unsalted. And to explain what salt means, essentially a salt is an extra bit you put in there, extra bit of a... Um, I'm trying to figure out how to put it. Noise. It, noise, yes, or entropy. Basically, you put the salt in there so that if someone has a different salt, the same password will come out to an entirely different hash. That stops pre-computation attacks. For instance, the password password is the same in an LM hash or an NTLM hash, no matter whose account it is. However, in, let's say, Linux, where they use a salt, well, that salt is somehow added in with that password, then hashed. If the salt's different, the resulting hash is different. So if you were to do a, uh, an attack, like a rainbow attack, you'd have to compute that rainbow table for every possible hat, yeah, every possible salt. Let's say it's a four byte salt, that gets huge quick, even for just a four byte salt. But uh, LM hashes are fairly simple. First of all, everything is converted to all of a case. That's one thing that makes it simpler. Uh, then they pad out the plain text with uh, null characters to make it 14 bytes long. So your maximum password is 14 bytes long. The last part's all nulls. Uh, then you split it into two 7-byte chunks. By the way, because of the mathematics of this, technically what you're doing is you're cracking two 7-byte passwords. The uh, physics of that, the mathematics behind that, it's far, far faster to crack two 7-byte passwords than it is one 14-byte password. Because once you get through the first 7, well, you just get to the next 7. Essentially, you're just cracking two 7-byte passwords, which becomes a lot simpler. Or, since they, it's null padded, it's possible if you have like a 9-character password, what you're really doing is cracking one 2-character password and one 7-character password. Ah, crap. Ah. <laughs> Preview. Did you hit the end key? Yeah, apparently. Alright. Also, these 7 characters are then used to uh, DES encrypt a known value. That known value, if you're really curious, is KGS, la da da la da da cartoon cuss word. Uh, <laughs> then it concatenates the two back together and stores it as a hash. Well, since it's split into two 7-byte chunks, this makes it incredibly easy to crack. It's basically you can crack them separately. It just makes life so... It just easy to crack. Now, luckily, you can turn this off, and in Vista and Newer, there is no LM hash. Uh, there's a hash you'll see in there, but basically it represents an empty hash, which you'll see here in a bit. Another hash that's stored in the SAM file is the NT Manager hash, the NTLM hash. Uh, essentially, what it is, is the Unicode password, so you, have, you can have other weird symbols in it as well, uppercase and lowercase, and it's MD4 hashed, and then stored. Now, it looks like it's simpler. The MD4 algorithm actually makes it much more complicated, but regardless, the MD4 hashing algorithm, while not as good as some modern hashing algorithms, is still a damn sight better than an LM hash. Uh, there's also, and it also, again, it's not salted. So, one person's NTLM uh, hash is the same as someone else's NTLM hash, as long as it's the same password. Now, uh, cache credentials are different. Those are salted with people's username as a salt. Not a great salt since it's so predictable, but well, we'll get to that in a, in a second. Um, there's several different ways people can dump a, a SAM database and pull out all the hashes. Now, back in the day, you used to be able to just grab the SAM file and pull the hashes out directly. Around NT4, I want to say Service Pack 4, they used something called SysKey, which adds an extra level of encryption. 
But the thing is, unless you start out on disk, you can just pull the syskey out of the system hive in the registry and use it. Now, there's ways you can store your syskey on an external disk or type it in, but and actually even up to Windows 7, if you type in syskey, you should be able to go in there and set that option. But the last time I tried this, and I probably tried it last on like Windows Vista, Siski is still expecting you to use a floppy disk. And if you don't have a floppy disk, it doesn't let you do it. And how many people now have a system that doesn't actually have a floppy disk? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's a problem. But, I mean, if you, if you go that far, I think they're relying on full hard drive encryption to take care of that problem instead of using a different way of implementing Siski. But Siski's still out there, which is why we have to grab both the SAM and the system file, as I showed you before with the boot CDs. Um, Kane's really good for dumping SAM files. Uh, there's a bunch of other tools as well. SAM dump 2, which you saw earlier. Remember how we pointed it to both the SAM and the system file? We could have took that output and loaded it into a bunch of different tools. That output put it in something called PW dump format. Uh, FG dump is like a current uh, version of that from the Fufus group. Uh, you can take that output and there's all sorts of cracking tools that would accept that in and understand it and crack it. Um, you have to massage it a bit for hash crack, which I'll demonstrate here in a bit. Uh, backtrack for a DVD, it has that SAM dump tool on it, so you can use that if you wish. Now, if you were to um, dump stuff from the uh, SAM file using backtrack, essentially, here's the series of commands you'd use. No need to write these down, these slides will be out there, I promise you. Unless my hard drive crashes, in which case this is lost forever. Actually, I got copies of this all over the place, so it's going to be out there. Uh, and this is also something I showed earlier in the class where I dumped the SAM file. Everybody remember it? Essentially, I'm just finding what disk out there is, uh, with F disk is probably going to be my uh, NTFS partition. I mount it. Well, I make a directory to mount it in. I go ahead and mount it. I use the force just in case it was mounted uncleanly uh, or dismounted uncleanly last time. I use SAM dump 2. And unfortunately, that's supposed to be one line, but it's so long, it's, it kind of goes together. This is all one line. I point to the system hive so that I can extract a key out of it, the syskey, and then I point to the SAM file so it can then pull the passive hashes. And then I pump it into hashes.txt so I can use that in something else. Instead, I'm just going to use Kane because I'm incredibly lazy. Now, Kane has a bunch of ways you can do this. Uh, if I was to uh, bring up um, this, let's see... So I'll insert, oh, I don't want to log into that one. I want to log into dot slash some user and uh, bad pass. By the way, yes, this is on the network. Please don't screw with it. This class will take a lot longer <laughs> if people were attacking the speaker during the t process. All right, um, now I just gave people ideas. All right, there's several ways you can use Kane to dump the passwords. If you're actually running as that particular account right dead in there, what you can do is um, just go into Cracker, and I already dumped them from the previous times. I'm just going to right click on all these and say we move. This should be more or less the virgin uh, setup. I'm going to remove all. Yes. Now I'm going to go here to uh, LM and NTLM hashes. And if I want to, when I can just click this little plus symbol and tell it to dump from the local database. However, if I wanted to load up that uh, LM hash, that uh, sorry, that uh, password dump formatted file from before, I can use this option. Right now, I'm just going to import from the local running machine, and I think it does some kind of DLL insertion attack to actually pull out those hashes. By the way, you'll notice that all these first LM hashes are exactly the same. The reason being is this is a Windows 7 box. So by default, LM hash storage is turned off. If you have the LM hashes, choose the cracked LM hashes. It's much, much quicker than the NTLM hashes. But notice the NTLM hashes, uh, test and administrator are the exact same one, but that's because both of them are the same password. I don't remember what I said it to at this point. But I used the exact same password for both of them, which is why they hashed out the exact same thing. There's no salt. I could, at this point, go ahead and crack this, but I'm going to show an alternate way to grab the hashes. This is assuming you're not an admin and they haven't dumped it from Linux. Let's say you used um, 
my uh, one of my other boot CDs, another boot CD for Windows, to, to copy off the sand in the system hive. What you can do is, I'm going to clear these out, click, click top, shift held down, right click, remove, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and say import, and I'm going to point it at a SAM and system hive that I copied off of a box. You can copy it off even by using a boot CD, pull the hard drive out of the machine, take it to another machine you do control, and copy them off. And I showed the file path to that much earlier on, the uh, C Windows System32 config directory. Just grab them right out of there. And if everybody wants to play with this, I actually, on that uh, zip file I had everybody download, wherever you saved it, inside that zip file, after you uh, unzip it, you should see something called Win7 config folder. I already copied them out for you, if you actually want to by hand go through and play with this. It points, asks you to point to the uh, SAM file. Well, there's my SAM file, and now it wants to know the boot key. This is the sys key it's asking for. I can point this at my system hive, same place, and essentially, I just have to uh, copy it, paste it right here, and now, in theory, it can pull the hashes straight out of those uh, hive keys I copied off. Now, I've chosen some bad passwords. But I want to be able to crack these fast because this is a classroom environment. This isn't going to be 100% realistic, but we don't want to take forever doing this. Let me show you some stuff that's inside the cane directory. Uh, if you go out to C, Program Files, Kane, all the Kane files are in there. Uh, inside of Word Lists, there's some default Word Lists that come with Kane. Ah, crap. Uh, by the way, while I'm in this directly, let me show you something else. You see these files that end with the LST extension? Let me sort by uh, type. These ones that come with the LST extension, these are basically things that have been dumped previously or paths that have been cracked previously. Basically, they're saved states. If I was to open one up, it would, uh, well, let me open up like, uh, let's see if I can find one that has something in it. I don't remember what's in dict.list. Uh, yeah, that's just a save file for, I think, the last uh, password thing I, I loaded up. Let me see if there's a different one. Install. I may have to run something before it actually give me anything, but... Basically, these are places where it actually dumps the hashes too. So if you want to dump with, uh, and I'll show this in a bit, if you want to dump with cane and crack with something else, you can. Hashcat, to my knowledge at least, doesn't have any dumpers built in. But it is faster for cracking. So you use cane to dump it, and then Hashcat to actually crack it. But let's go into the word list. Inside a word list, I actually added something. I added it further down the list um, in alphabetical order. But... Um, I had to add it. I'm using bad pass as my example of a bad password. This is not actually in Kane's default dictionary. I've added it myself just so we can actually do the crack. And I added it down here in more or less alphabetical order. If you want this actually to work on your machine, you'll have to add bad pass to your dictionary. I should have chose one that was already in the dictionary, but when I was setting up the demos for this, I didn't think about actually doing that. Let's go ahead and try to crack that. Let's uh, choose, and we can do all sorts of different attacks. If you have remote tables loaded up, you can choose those. You also have the option you see on all these different cracking ways of doing LM hashes or NTLM hashes. You can also do challenge response if you uh, sniff something off the wire, but that's something you may want to cover in a future sniffing class instead. I can't do the LM hash cracking because I don't have the LM hashes. This is a Windows 7 box, so it only has the NTLM hashes. Uh, brute force attack, this is essentially where it goes through and tries all the different character combinations. If I was to bring that up, you can actually go in there. It shows you the key space, like the total number of combinations. You can choose what character sets you want to go through, minimum and maximum password length, and so forth. That takes forever. I'm going to do a dictionary attack. Now, to do a dictionary attack, you just go to dictionary attack, I've highlighted all the uh, all the accounts as you can see. I'm gonna do NTLM hashes. Now, if you've ran this before previously, which I have, you may have to go up to your word list, right-click on it. You can add more lists if you want to. I'm gonna say reset to initial file position. 
That way it actually starts back from the beginning. I was doing some cracking before, and it remembers where you are in the, in the file so you can resume later. I don't want to resume. I just want it to start cracking. So um, let me go ahead and hit... Oh, these are all the different ways you can... Remember he's talking about permutations? I've also seen it referred to as hybrid attack. I think that's other terminology for it. You can take the passwords in the uh, dictionary and try them in multiple different ways. Like password as is, reverse the password, the password twice, so on and so forth. Uh, let's go ahead and hit start and have it start trying to crack those passwords. As you can see, it found the that NTLM hash corresponds to the password bad pass. And it's continuing on through the list. Had I wanted to actually put that one to crack inside of Hashcat, I could have. I'll show you how we would have done that. I'm going to stop this. I got the bad pass, and that was just a simple crack from uh, there. When I did this dump, it actually dumped it out into an LST file. So let's see if I can find that LST file. Let me see. I want to sort by... Uh, eh, let me get this sort. Yes. Sort by uh, date modified. That helps me find the one I just dumped. Alright, this NTLM one, I'm going to open that bad boy up. And here's the fo fo format it's in. This is not a format that's going to be easily accepted by our uh, friend Hashcat. I want to find the hash I want, though, to crack. And that particular one, <coughs> strange enough, did it remove it once it saw I had cracked it? It looks like it may have gone in and uh, removed it once it knew it cracked it. So let me go back in here. Let's just do a straight dump again. I'm just going to... Empty all these out again. I guess once it figured it cracked it once, it didn't need to crack it again. I'm just going to import them from the local system. And there we go. Now, hopefully, if I reopen that file, we'll actually have it stored in there. That's not the one I meant to open. But regardless, there we go. There's that hash. Now, this is just one hash. If I want to put that in some format that, um, uh, let's say, Hashcat can understand, I'll just create a text file with just that. New text file. Hashes and uh, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> Wait for programs to respawn. The demo gods. Yeah, the demo gods are not always necessarily smiling. <laughs> Just die. Also not happy. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe VMware is having a problem with coming out of sleep mode because I, I put this thing in and out of sleep mode a couple times, and I think that may be causing part of my uh, problems. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start that back up. Huh? Well, it looks like. Well, what do you know? It was all okay. That's uh, actually. I wonder if it's still in my pasteboard. Ah, uh, not that lucky. All right, let's go and find that cane folder again. C program files. And sorry, I'm kind of rushing it a little bit, but I know where the time is drawing short. I'm gonna open that back up. You can do Notepad. I've got Notepad plus plus of this. There's my hash in question. I can put that on line by itself, or I can copy one after another after another, line after line, into the exact same thing. I'm just going to save it right there. It could be the same hat, different hashes over and over again. 
If there's no salt, that's all you have to do. If there's a salt for the hash, essentially, by default, you use a, a colon and a whatever. Whatever the salt is. But I don't have salts for these. These are unsalted. By its very nature, LM hashes and NTLM hashes are not salted. I'm going to use the hashcat GUI and I'm going to point it towards my hash file, which I put on my desktop. And I just call it hashes. I'm going to point it towards a word list, and I can do a bunch of different word lists. And they showed you much more detail, and go back and watch the video to uh, get more details on um, all the different things you can do with Hashcat. I'm going to just go with a simple thing. I'm going to point it towards uh, program files. I already have Kane's dictionary around, so I'm going to use Kane's word list and use it. At that point, I have to choose what hash to crack. They were choosing mostly uh, MD5. Uh, this happens to be uh, NTLM hash that we have in here. So we're going to choose NTLM and going to click I am the hash killer. <laughs> I guess they change that from time to time. I could choose an output file, but I'm just going to have it output it straight to the screen. Hash and it ran so fast that the hounds didn't catch him all the way down. Never mind, sorry. Older uh, Johnny Horton song. Uh, I get a little loopy as class moves on. But right here is, you can see it found that hash represents bad pass. If I wanted to, I could have output it straight to a file instead, which probably would have, would have been a better idea. But that's a real quick example of using Hashcat to crack salmon system. Uh, uh, hash is out of the SAM. It's Windows uh, passwords. Let me see. Now, we'll talk a little bit about memory uh, time uh, memory trade-offs. Now, as people are, are doing things, especially LM hashes, where you only have seven possible characters that are split into two chunks, uh, rainbow tables are awesome. Basically, the pre-computation hash, hash uh, pre-computation attacks, from the standpoint is all the possible password hashes for a given set of strings are all pre-computed and put in a database. And essentially, as soon as you get a hash, you just go out to the database and look it up. Now, with salts, this becomes a lot more difficult because one person's version of a password is not the same as someone else's version of a password. Uh, for every bit of a salting value, basically you double the space that someone would have to take up with a rainbow table to be able to crack that, which is kind of the idea, I guess, behind using Hashcat instead because you don't have to use that storage. But, I mean, there are time trade-offs. Um, that can be made, and if you have the LM hashes, definitely look into using rainbow tables, because there should be rainbow tables out there that you could reasonably get on a decently huge hard drive and crack any LM hash you want almost instantaneously. All right, SAM cracking prevention. I'm going to talk a little bit about preventing this from happening. First of all, choose stronger local passwords. You know, use uh, different ASCII, uh, use them longer, use them more uh, alphanumeric and odd characters, and also, if you really want to get uh, strange, who here has ever used an alt numpad? Use alt numpad, you can type in any ASCII character you want. Like I use, uh, I think, alt234 puts an omega symbol in. You just make sure the num lock's on. I can't remember if it's the right or left alt key you have to hold down. I think it's back to the left. And then type in the ASCII code equivalent, and there you go. This works in Windows, not necessarily other operating systems. And you're able to um, type in any old ASCII character. Uh, turn off LM hashes. You can do that via the information in this particular uh, Microsoft Knowledge Base article. You can do it via GPO. Really, unless you have a bunch of uh, downloadable clients like um, Windows 98 or something, or Windows Millennium still in your network, you really probably don't need LM hashes. So just dump them. They're off by default in Vista and thereafter. If you use passwords longer than 14 characters, let's say you work someplace that won't turn off LM hashes. If you choose a password longer than 14 characters, it won't store a LM hash because it can't split it into two 7-byte chunks because it's too big for that. So, you know, choose a password that's longer than 14 characters. Uh, you can change local passwords frequently and rely on domain passwords if possible. That way if someone cracks a local password, it's not directly like they, can, they uh, cracked a domain password that they can use all over the place. However, as I was talking about before, once you get 
a password on one local box, you can install things to grab passwords that might be network centric instead. And obviously, don't use the same uh, local admin password on public boxes as you would staff boxes. For instance, let's say you work at a, at a school. You probably don't want to use the same local admin passwords for the students as you would for the teachers. Because you're just asking for students to grab passwords out and uh, attack the teachers' machines, change their grades, whatnot. All right, there's also some fascist methods that may not be practical in most cases. You can use the BIOS to disable booting, and depending on when and where you do this, that's probably not a bad idea. If you keep them from being able to boot from a hard drive, if nothing else, if you keep them from being able to boot from like the movable media, if nothing else, you slow them down. It generally means they're going to have to open up the box, reset the BIOS password, or pull the hard drive out and do something with it. Also, full hard drive encryption would also take care of that. You can also configure syskey to uh, run off a disk at boot time. Though, like I said, there's still syskey when you use a tool, it's still oriented towards the idea of using a floppy disk, which is not practical modern days. All right, Linux and Unix passwords. This is a little bit different, and I'm not sure I have everything I need to actually try to crack these. But I'll at least show you where the hashes are. Essentially, I showed you Hashcat. You simply choose a different kind of hash you wish to crack. That's all there is to it, really. Uh, let me, uh, actually, I'm going to continue that slideshow, but I need to find, ah, oh, there we go. I'm going to use uh, Backtracks 1. Go back to the slideshow where that's loading. All right. What passwords look in the heart of the users? The shadow knows. It used to be uh, at old uh, Unix boxes, the password was pretty much world, well, the password hash was world readable to everybody inside of slash Etsy slash password, uh, passwd. Uh, since then, they've moved into shadow, which is not world readable, but if you root, you can still read it. Uh, a password hash, and I've color coded this one on, uh, let's say, a modern Linux box looks something like this. And I've broken in what the parts are. This right here, this dollar sign and some number, represents the kind of hash it is. If you see a dollar sign 1, it's probably an ND5 hash. If you see a 2, blowfish. 5 is SHA-256, and a 6 is SHA-512. And when you go into a um, hash cat or something like that, you'll have to choose the proper hashing type. Um, the green part here is the salt. The salt adds randomness. So let's say the password is bad pass. If the salt differs, if that salt differs, then the uh, resulting hash is going to differ, which is why salted passwords, it becomes rather impractical to use rainbow table style attacks. Yes? Now, is that the actual salt, or is that a hash of the salt? That is a salt. The hash is this part. The, yeah, the salt there is the actual you would type in for salt, GF, capital GFK. Yes. Okay. If I was to represent this as something for a hash cat, what it would be is it would be all this stuff in yellow, colon, this salt. Okay. Yes? Um, isn't there something where you use aliases or do, um, instead of, like, not the NC password or it's a shadow, but there's some stuff you can do with PAMD, and I'm not as familiar with it as I'd like to be, where you can point it to be someplace else. I mean, the password yeah, could actually, you can make a, a Linux box a, 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 attached to some other type of authentication system. This is just the default authentication system that usually when you install something like Ubuntu, it's going to have. I mean, you can make it authenticate against like a, a Kerberos system or a an NT domain if you really want to. And then a lot of stuff wouldn't necessarily apply. Like if you did an NL like into the NT password, you see like a, with the elastic and where the password build is, or you can change that to... Yeah. Like this file I'm actually showing you, actually I, 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 I will get to that in just, I don't know, that's, that's fine. By the way, I've got some good helpful links here on Wikipedia that explains it. the system inside of Pro also has some information. And that's why I found this information about which particular symbol in the front tells you what kind of hashing algorithm. A lot of old style uh, Unix passwords are just uh, DES uh, encrypted. Or I should say, I think they're used to 
encrypt a new a known DES value. I don't remember exactly the algorithm they use. If you don't see a number in front of them, there might be a type of DES uh, obfuscation that's used. All right, let me see. Where's my Unix? Linux, uh, sorry, Linux box. I went too far. There we go. I'm going to. Uh, I start up my uh, backtrack box. And let's actually show the password there. Let's see. I think it's. Um, let's cat out Etsy password. Now, as I say, in old style uh, Unix systems, this would actually have the password hash right there where you'd see it. Here, you don't actually have it. I believe that's the X here. That's because they don't want that world readable. They want that to where only like admins or sorry, root can see it. So um, they move into something called shadow, which since I am root, I can see that. So let me cat out shadow. And most of these accounts don't actually have a password, but if I move on up to root, you see it does have a password. And this particular one uh, corresponds to the password Tor, T-O-O-R, but that's where the hash actually is. And I could copy that out if I wanted to and do a crack on it with a hash cat. But that's where you'd find them on a Linux box. Um, another type of hash I'd like to talk about is, and I find these really interesting, Windows cache credentials. By default on a, uh, most Windows systems, the last 10 users, they get the credentials cached in the local machine. That way, if someone logs in, tries to log in, and there's network problems where they can't contact the domain controller, they can still get access to the box. Now, I think there's some version of Windows, I'm trying to think, is it Windows uh, 2008 on Civit that's cached as like 25 different ones? But uh, to my knowledge, on even up to Windows 7, it's 10. Though Windows 7 does something a little different, which I'll cover here just shortly. Basically, the way these whole stored uh, credentials work, they're there so that um, if the domain goes down or network communications to the domain controls go down, people can still log in. And what they do is they use this special secret stored here in what's known as the, uh, the, the NLK M key uh, inside local share, sorry, local, I'm trying to remember what LSA stands for. Failure on that. Anyway, there's a key there, and that... Local Security Authority? Yeah, Local Security Authority? Uh, and the key is stored there, and that key is used for unencrypting values that are in the registry at these locations. NL dollar sign 1 through NL dollar sign 10. And I think that these particular uh, keys you can't actually get to via administrative privileges. You have to be system, unless you go in as system and then go into the registry and assign anybody to have rights to them. Or you can do some kind of, you know, hack to become system or get system level privileges and grab them anyway. Now the basic algorithm is these are more secure than NTLM hashes or LM hashes because they all salted, sort of, the salt with the username. Basically, and this is the algorithm I looked up online via Insider Pro, the username is turned to all lowercase, the Unicode version of it. It's added on with the person's password, also Unicode. All that is MD4 together, and that's MD4 again. And so essentially, this username acts as salt. So let's say two people have the password monkey. Well, it's going to be a different hash resulting because they have different usernames. Does that kind of explain the whole idea of hashing better? And salt. And so, uh, sorry, and, and salting. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So is it per Windows box or the domain here? What if you're connected to a solid domain? Can it store more than 10 caches? Well, it's, well it, it depends what the client is. This is on the client. Okay. These passwords, these stored credentials are on the client. Yeah, but you're saying that's if it was Windows XP, it would hold 10. If it was Windows 7, it might hold more than 10? Well, if Windows 7, I think, also holds 10. Okay. But I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, so they can hold more. They can all hold more, but that's the default oh. in the registry. If you go to uh, sexpol.msc, you can set the value. You can set it to be nothing if you yeah. want to. That's what uh, most of the hardware servers will have. Is it's yeah, stable. but my understanding is also if you have a Windows 2000, I think it's Windows 2008 box, and let's say it's not a domain controller in and of itself, 
my understanding is I believe they store 25 by default. I was reading something along this, and I may be completely off base. Um, I always it happens. It's 10, but you know, who knows? Could be. Workstations are definitely 10. Yeah, most workstations that seem to have all 10. I, there was a certain version of uh, Windows that was more than 10 by default. Probably but would be like a, could it be like a domain? Well, no. It wouldn't be a domain controller because what's the point of caching them on a domain controller? Yeah. You can talk to yourself. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know. All right. I was going to show this off in Windows 7. Unfortunately, all the tools I know of for doing this don't seem to actually work in Windows 7. Uh, there's actually a Python script out there for uh, dumping them, but I haven't got a chance to really play with that enough to, to test it. Usually I use Windows, uh, sorry, I, I use, I use uh, Kane for dumping stored credentials, but as you can see, it didn't do a very good job of it. It knows the number of characters in my domain, and it even got the right number of characters in the username I was using. This is that some user, or actually some domain user, I believe, that I mentioned before. But it didn't actually pull out the right characters. So currently, Kane cannot dump Windows 7 uh, hashes properly. And I even used this hash, and I used the, uh, the username, which I already knew. Still, no joy. It didn't actually work. By the way, this right here, that's the format you would use if you were to load up uh, cache credentials inside of Kane. I'm uh, not sorry, inside of Hashcat. I'm going to show that here in a second. Uh, let me go ahead and before I go into how to stop this from happening, let's go ahead and uh, go back to our system and uh, show doing this in Kane. Um, actually, I'm going to use my local box just because VMware has been giving us some fits here recently. Let's uh, show the desktop. And here I have Kane. I don't care that the firewall is enabled since I'm not going to do anything on the network. If we do a sniffers class later on, we have a lot of nifty uh, network stuff we can do with Kane. All right, I'm going to go into cache credentials. I can try dumping my local Windows 7 cache credentials, say, from local system. But this one's never been attached to a domain, so I get nothing anyway. But that's what those all question mark screenshot I showed you. Try it on your Windows 7 box. If you can figure a way to make it actually work, please let me know. Instead, I... Yes? When I was trying to it, it was saying that the file was... Wait, what were you trying to do? I was actually trying to dump the same. Okay, were you doing it off of a live system? Yes. Here's the deal with that. If you're up in Windows, you can't load the SAM or the, sorry, the system SAM or the security file of the Windows that's currently running. So you have to use a boot CD, copy them off, and use an offline version of them. Now, there's one weird exception to that. There's a tool called, uh, I think it's called iSword. It's meant for like uh, debugging problems with like spyware. But you can actually point it at a file that's locked and say, copy the for this for me anyway. And you can then take that copy. But yeah, if it's a live system, that's why we have to boot from a boot CD to grab that SAM and system and uh, security file. Because it's going to be locked by default if you try to do it from the, from the install that it's currently running from. I remember using this program Sam's side and you'd be able to point it, uh, not using Windows 7, but more of XP and you'd still be able to go to the... Even if it was... Open it. Sam and then it'll import it out. And, and it, it wasn't, do, do, it wasn't do using DLL insertion for it? No, I mean, it, was, it, was, it wasn't even done. It was just... Huh. Go, it doesn't work on Windows 7, but on, uh, on XP, just say import... Uh, well, uh, well... At least in Kane, yeah, in Kane and also Stand Up 2, they're going to have to be offline. You just basically make a copy of them. Or in Stand Up 2, you're actually booted up in a Linux environment, so they're not they're not locked anyway. So I'm going to go into uh, MS Cache Credentials. Actually, Stand Up 2 does not dump MS Cache Credentials. That's a different thing. Remember how in, uh, when we dumped in LM and NTLM hashes, we pointed it at SAM and system? It's something similar with MS Cache, MS cache hashes. But we point it at something a little different. We're going to point it at the system hive. And I already told you, it doesn't seem to work with Windows 7. Uh, if you want to play around, if it actually included um, those hives in that download I gave everybody. Um, I'm going to point it towards the, uh, conf the files I have XP config folder. And... Uh, Wait, which one was I have to get first? I'm trying to, oh, system. 
and I'm going to point it towards security. Say next. Can Nessus come to your sandbox while you're using I think Nessus can. Nessus can? I actually, I honestly don't know. If you know other tools that can do it, let me know. Now, the ones I've seen that do do it, you don't point them directly at the file. It basically, uh, it does it like a DLL insertion into, um, well, Kane's a little different also. Not Kane, uh, Mesclo's a little different also. But it basically does something other than reading directly from the file. It uses stuff that's up uh, running processes and injects something into them to actually be able to extract the hashes as opposed to putting it through the SAM system. But here I have the hash, and if I wanted to, I could start cracking it. Um, I will do that here shortly. I actually will not do it now. You, uh, just, you imported the XP ones that you did? Yes, I used the XP one. Oh, I'm getting the okay. What A are you getting? Uh, let me try again. Let me, let me do that one more time. Uh, I'm going to remove this from the list. I'm going to hit plus. And essentially what I do is I point the system to the system uh -huh. and security to security. Say next. And there's my hash. And if I wanted to, I could then go ahead and do an attack. And much like LM and NTLM hashes, I have several different options. I'm just going to do a dictionary attack and start that bad boy up. And it should run through and... Oh, I don't, actually don't have a dictionary loaded. In Kane, you may have to go add to list and choose a password list to use. So in this case, I would point it towards C... Actually, you know what? I don't think I actually ever actually uh, set that up. So program files, x86 in this case, because I'm running on 64-bit windows. Um, Word lists, word list. And I just recalled that I don't think I ever actually added that password in there. Bad pass. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's bad pass. Well, I wanted to keep it simple because it's a shame that, you know, if I actually forgot my own uh, bad password while I was doing a class on bad passwords, so go figure. All right, let's bring up word lists. And for giggles, for giggles, let's go ahead and add that to the uh, end. All right. And I'm going ahead and uh, tell it not to do any kind of mangling of it. Just password as is and have it start up. But you, I used Kane there to dump it, and you see it cracked it. It took it a couple seconds, but not too awful long. If the people choose a good password, cracking this, the, the, the cache tash for the uh, domain credentials is pretty difficult if they got like a passphrase or something. Um, and as I was showing you before, Windows 7 currently, I'm not sure what tools can actually dump that. There might be one. If anybody knows of one or finds one, please let me know. Let's say I want to do the exact same thing with Hashcat instead. Uh, I can do that. I just have to... Um, let me find this. When I did my dump, it actually put things in a file for me. So I can do that by uh, finding... Ah, uh, yes. Cache.lst. That's a little text file that contains those hashes. But you see, since I actually successfully cracked it, it uh, seems to have removed it. So let me, let me go ahead and clear this again and get that hash back and make it think that we never actually cracked it. If nothing else, you should get a lot more familiar with um, Kane by the end of this. All right, there we go. Actually, you could. Kane has a, so many different features on it. Huh. Well, let me close out of this because for some reason, should you want to? Yes, I do. All right, now it's actually put it in there. 
And you see the format's a little different. The way the format is going to work for Hashcat is we've got to take the hash and colon then the salt. To do that, I'm going to uh, see. show my desktop. I'm going to create me a little text file here. So basically that and some, and let me actually uh, go back to my cache list. Some domain user was the username. There we go. That is now my list of hashes. And it could be a whole series of different hashes if I wanted to. As, you always, as uh, Modern Alex was showing y'all, Hashcat actually shines at its best when you're cracking multiple hashes. So I'm going to load the Hashcat GUI. I'm going to point it at my hash file, which I saved to my desktop. I'm going to choose a word list, which in this case, I'll just go ahead and use my uh, cane word list since I have it. Like I said, go check out some of Ron's word lists. You'll probably have better luck. Uh, let's see. Oh, looks like I can, I can add an entire directory. Let's see if that actually works. I inadvertently did that, but let's see if that works. That'd be kind of neat. Can you drill down to that and see if it'll let you check individual files? Hmm? Doesn't seem to. Oh. Well, let's run it and see what happens. You see I, on the hash type, I chose uh, domain cache credentials. I can choose different mode. We can set the rules. But ah, I didn't seem to like... Oh, there we did. It did work. And by the way, you saw how it took Kane a couple of seconds, even when I was just passing by itself? That was almost instantaneous. I literally thought I had an error because it came back so fast. Right there, bad password. Now, granted, we're using a very oversimplified case for, uh, for um, the sake of the class, but you get the idea of how this could be used in a real-world environment to if someone finds a public station that a few domain users have logged into, dumps these hashes, and messes around. And it's really easy to do if it's an XP box or Windows 2000 box. I'm assuming this though, you can probably still do it. I haven't tested. Windows 7, so far the tools I have don't work. But if someone finds a tool that does work, please let me know because I'd be curious to see it. I'm pretty sure eventually um, Mao or someone else, Mao's the guy who develops um, Kane. I'm pretty sure eventually they'll figure that one out. Okay. Uh, originally, there used to be something called cache dump for dumping these, but Kane 2.68 and later implemented this already, and it's a lot easier to use Kane than the cache dump system. Um, and Kane, I think, is currently almost up to 5. It's like 4.9 something. Hopefully, before long, Mao will actually implement it and get better Windows 7 support as well. I know he's been working on some other things that are giving him problems, I think, in Windows 7 and has been fixing it, so maybe this would be on that list as well. Now, there's ways you can uh, count these uh, cracking of uh, <laughs> cracking creds counted. Uh, you can, uh, a few countermeasures. Obviously, if you choose stronger domain passwords, it's going to be harder. If these weren't, in fact, these are very short passwords I'd be cracking, and the fact I actually added them to my dictionary, these would be incredibly hard to crack. If people are using actual passphrases, caching these uh, cached domain credentials wouldn't be very easy. So it's a hard attack to pull off from that standpoint. However, if people are using really simple short passwords, like seven character passwords, if you got a decent machine, and as you saw, you saw how much faster his, uh, what is it, OCL cat was uh, than regular. These cache domain credentials are supported by that, as I recall from seeing his slides. A uh, few other options you can do, you can go into this particular key, which got all mangled because of the lineup link for it, and tell it not to uh, cache any credentials. The problem with that is you better have a very reliable network and very reliable domain controllers. Otherwise, if it goes down, people aren't going to be log in, which, depending on your environment, is not going to be a good thing. And you can set that via GPO if you really want to. Uh, also, 
you can use a lot of the same uh, fascist methods I mentioned before. If the hard drive is completely encrypted, it's going to be hard to extract that uh, system and the uh, security file to be able to dump the hashes the way I showed you. Uh, a little bit of information on uh, unknown apps. And this part, I think, is interesting from the standpoint, let's say you have an application that you have no idea where it's storing the password. Well, we want to figure out how it's doing that. I have several different tools I use for trying to figure out what is writing where. Uh, Process Activity View and Reg App from App are two tools I like. And these are both from Nearsoft and Procmon. Of the three, I like Procmon the best. I'm going to go ahead and demo those real quick as well. I'm going to uh, switch to my Windows VM and show this off. All right. Show me which particular things I want to show. Okay. I'm going to, for giggles, I'm going to shut down WinBNC. the way I want to do it. Actually, now I think about it, I don't need to actually stop it. Uh, if I go into uh, password class, tools, not in this off folder, but here in this folder right inside tools, I have a process activity view. I'm going to right click on it and tell it run as administrator. It doesn't automatically know to try to promote its privileges, so I have to manually tell it. And then in this list, I got to find WinBNC and choose it. And hopefully I chose the right instance of it. No. <laughs> Die. Alright. Load up WinBNC. Now I'm also going to load up this um, Registrum app. And you notice that time I didn't run it with admin privileges. It didn't show me nearly as many uh, processes. You got to make sure you right click on it and say run as administrator. Yes. I left UAC on just to be a worst case scenario. And I'm going to bring up WinVNC. Alright, I have these two running in the background. Now I'm going to go into WinVNC and I always showed you where this password happens to be. But I'm going to its admin properties and muck around. Uh, let's set it to uh, bad pass. Say apply. OK. Well, nothing came up in the registry. And pull it. Uh, yes. Maybe because it wasn't actually editing anything in the registry. But if we look here, we see that uh, process activity view Notice it started messing around with two different files. One was inside of local temp, and one was inside of ultra VNC. So if we go and look at that file, which I always showed you earlier when we were looking around for ultra VNC, now I know what file that, that password is possibly stored in, because as soon as I edited the password, that file was touched by that process. So that's one way you can find out. Uh, let me show you a different tool that we can... Uh, Use and maybe use something a little bit more, mm, maybe a little bit more complicated. Let's use Procmon. You got a security warning. Ah, thanks for the warning about the warning. <laughs> um, all right, let me uh, open up Procmon. Procmon is something from Microsoft now since they bought uh, Sys Internals. And I like it even better. There's things that I've seen that got missed in, um, by Nears Tools. Not to say anything wrong with Nears Tools, but that, but that I can find in Process Monitor. Uh, I just started it up. I'm going to reset the filters to the fault so it shows me all the processes and everything that everything is doing. You can do that also by going to Filter and say Reset Filter. This is important so that you see everything. And I have it up and running right now. I can go in and I can turn off things I want to view. I can view process activity, network activity, uh, sorry, file system activity, 
and registry activity. Uh, at this point, I don't want to see anything about processes and network activity, so I'll turn off those two. Um, so basically, I'm just looking at registry and also, sorry, um, file system activity. And I want to see some uh, individual app, what it's up to. Well, I, I already had a demo app, if anybody wants to play with it, and it's called uh, Password Example. It basically has my face as an icon looking awfully morose. Um, if you want to see what it's doing, Process Monitor is awesome for this because you can click this little scope, point it at the window for your process. You can actually manually find it also. It's just easier to use the scope. And it only shows me that process. Now I can go looking through this. But you see it shows me a lot of stuff. Like It shows me like DLLs that's loaded and all sorts of different places in the registry it's looked. I probably want to look for specific types of uh, activity. Well, I can go into filter and modify this filter. As you can see, currently it's filtering by the PID because it found out the PID when I did that little scope dragging. It found out what the PID of that process was. I can filter by tons of things, but I want to filter it specifically by operation. And let's say the operation I want to look for, I want to see if it's doing anything uh, interesting with the registry. So let's do reg, or actually let's use the drop down since I may very well misspell it in the process. There's something called reg query value. And we'll want to see reg query value. We want to add that to our list of filters. Say OK. And now it should only show us items where a registry value was queried. Now, if you see it has the password up there and it knows it because it has, you know, starred off, it's possible you could look through all of this and eventually find it. But as you can see, there's a lot of details in there. If I actually know the password, I uh, might be able to go choose the first record because it seems to search from whatever your current record is. Uh, edit find. And I happen to know the password I typed in was bad pass. It may not show me that because of the way it encodes it. I think it encodes it in a hexadecimal. All oh, right, found it anyway. And I know I entered that, and right there you see it's pointing me towards that key. And that's where it queried this particular value, and it got that key out. Another nice thing about this tool is I think we can right-click and say jump to. And it takes us right there in the registry editor. And we can look at it. And you see how bad pass was stored in there as the password. Now granted, this is a lame application I wrote myself to demonstrate this with class. Because it's easier to do this than to like load up Skype and to uh, work through all the different records that are coming up to find that. And I've used it on Skype before to figure out, I still don't know how to obfuscate it, but to figure out where it, I think it's storing the password. But that's one way you can use this. Uh, a better way, probably from the filter standpoint, if we go back into filter and we remove this one and uh, we go ahead instead, do a search for uh, registry set value. Like, for instance, if we have control of an application and we go ahead and set the value ourselves, so we can watch for that as well. Yes, add an item, say OK. And, oh, that's why I never actually have set it, because I never actually hit log in. If I log in with the proper username and password, it will set it for me. And okay. it shows it to me right there. Uh, I can also do much the same thing with file system operations with this. I can go into filter. I can remove this one. And I can look for, um, I think it's file right. Let me look. Oh, write file. It's frozen up on me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let me tell you something. This is an exercise for everybody else to try. <laughs> Do the exact same thing I did for all the registry stuff, but instead look for write file. And you'll see where I not only stored the password in the registry, I also did it for the file system, just to give you an example. Uh, oh, uh-huh. 
it came back. All right, there's my filter. I'm going to add in. Strange enough, this is actually a recently rebuilt box. Uh, Top of the vehicle, you want to go to you. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I'm looking could for... It, could it be under fast I.O.? Near the top? I saw stuff about reads and writes. Yeah. Right. You yeah, see, right? fast I.O. right. Fast I.O. right. But I don't think it was that, because I wrote it down the one I actually found it under was right. Is it under operation, or is it under something else? I'm not... Huh. I'm pretty sure it was only operation. Well, uh, let's just go ahead and reset it all. Alright. And see, I see a whole bunch of stuff going on right here. Some user update that are roaming. I'm going to head and... Uh, Tell it not to look at registry stuff either. Don't look at network stuff. Don't look at process stuff. Just show me file system stuff. You see what's actually running the EXE at some point? Oh, actually, and I want to show it only this process. By the way, I can right click on a process and say include. May I have your attention, please? The time is now 4.30, and at this time, all computer labs are closed. The service include just the PID and uh, start looking through this. Oh, actually, that looks promising, doesn't it? And you might be right. Maybe it is. I seem to recall when I was doing this inside of my VM before I was using write file. That's what I was looking for. But it looks like I, did, I wrote down the wrong one. Maybe it is fast IO write. Because you see that text file right there? It wrote something into it. And I can actually jump straight to it. And if I recall right, yeah, it opens up the directory, and I can actually look at the file, and there's my username and password. This, like I said, these are incredibly simplified versions of it, not real world, but it gives you enough of an idea of how to use the application to use it on a real world one, as opposed to sitting there searching through... Well, you saw how much of a pain in the butt it was to search for all those records for just that simple application. All right. Let's move on. Um, if you don't know how something is hashed, you can do... Uh, a quick uh, copy of the hash and do a Google search for it and see if someone's already cracked that particular hash. I've had good luck with that. Now, granted, you're kind of leaking information about you know the password you're working on to Google, which could be bad. You can also like a look at the source code if it's available. And if you're good with a debugger like Ollie Debug, you might be able to sit there, uh, look at the stack, and figure out exactly how it's hashing it. I can't do that, but someone else here might be able to do that. Uh, other weird vectors for finding passwords on a box, and I think I'm going to cover these We're very close to the end. Inverse brute force, what I already talked about. I, you know, set, George Collins' seven uh, words you can't say on TV. You use those seven words, like, well, let's say, fuck. You use that, you already know a bunch of usernames. And there's tools out there for basically extracting usernames from a domain name. Basically, it searches the websites and pulls out all the possible email addresses it finds. The first part, that's probably a username. You take all those usernames and then use those as uh, the things that change and use the same password for all of them. Someone out there probably has a four-letter word if you don't have decent password restriction policies. Uh, also, it's less likely to trip lockout from the standpoint is you're not trying multiple passwords on one account. You're trying one password on multiple accounts. Uh, a word about automation. There's tons of ways you can uh, make a, a U-free thumb drive. There's always pre-made payloads where you just pop in the thumb drive and have it auto-run. Now, a lot of modern systems have auto-run turned off, which is why you can use something like the uh, programmable hid devices I've been talking about on the website recently to automate it in a different way. But those automated ways of basically dumping all these passwords so you can just plug a thumb drive in, wait a few seconds, pull it back out, then go do your cracking or your looking at the passwords later. And... Uh, Hack5 has a great wiki on that, and I have a video on making one of these u free thumb drives, but it's for instant response. This guy, instead of cracking passwords, what he does is you plug this thing in, it dumps a ton of information about the system that might be of interest later on to find out how it's compromised, and then you can take it down so it doesn't continue to compromise other boxes on your network. And that's a little tool Russell uh, Bucarini came up with. 
Another interesting place to find passwords I've found uh, is in the logs. How many people have accidentally typed their username and password and they screwed it up and they typed their username as a password in the username field? Yeah, uh, yeah. So if you start looking for bad logins and then a successful login right afterwards, sometimes you can go out there and find passwords that got stored in the log files. And I actually have a tool called a PIBCAC attack. PIBCAC stands for a problem exists between keyboard and chair. It only works in XP for the time being. I think Windows 2000. I need to update it to work in Windows Vista, Windows Vista in 7. But if you want to manually go through there, you can try looking for times when people uh, had failed logins and see if the reason they had a failed login is because they typed the wrong thing into the wrong field. All right. Wrapping things up, a few events I want to let you all know about. ShoeCon is coming up on September 18th down in Atlanta, Georgia. Probably far for most of y'all, but it's being held for the same charity that this class was held for. The Louisville InfoSec is coming up in October 7th. Uh, hope you all can make it. DerbyCon 2011 is uh, coming up in, of course, 2011, September. So it's more than a year away, but it should be a decent-sized con. We're going for something more ShmooCon, DefCon-esque than uh, some other conferences. Is it the US? Yes. Oh, Currently, the current organizers are uh, Martin, myself, and Dave Kennedy. Oh, cool. Um, and so, of course, all of us will be speaking there. And we got some other big names, which I can't talk about quite yet. Um, also, Freaknik, Nauticon, and Outerzone are all ones I recommend going to, and SkydogCon, whenever he actually figures out a date for it. Finally, questions. Sorry that last part was so rushed, but I know we're about to get kicked out. I just want to let you know that we're closing in five. You don't have to be out of here by about quarter still. We really appreciate it. No problem. I just finished up. And as I'm shutting down the machine, uh, anybody want to ask any questions? Uh,